future into the past. Don't want to do that. The idea is that Jesus came back in 70 AD. That's false. That's called preterism. That simply means pastism, or in my British, pastism, putting the future into the past. That is going to destroy your hope. You don't want to do that. Because in Colossians 1, 4, and 5, your faith and your love are because of your hope. And so if you're going to say that Jesus came back in some sense in 70 AD, you're destroying your hope, you're destroying yourself. False teaching is poison. You, we need to learn to love the truth. The devil has a great lie going out there. That is, just be a good person and you're fine. That's not true. Nice to be a good person. Of course we must be a good person. But the truth is broader than that. Jesus said that the words that he spoke to us are spirit and life, and we're to worship God in truth. So defining who God is and who Jesus is is first on the list of good doctrines, good teachings. The danger then with saying that Christ came back in 70 AD in any sense is that you're saying the resurrection has occurred. So your prime text when you're talking across the coffee table is 1 Corinthians 15:23. I'll remind you of that, we won't have time to look them all up. But 1 Corinthians 15, 23, Paul says, those who belong to Christ, those who are Christians in the biblical sense, will be resurrected from the dead at his coming. Greek word parousia. We use the modern Greek pronunciation, I've said for our audience, at Atlanta Bible College. I'm happy to tell you they do that at Harvard too, so we're, we're up with the best uh, in, that, in that regard with the language. It's only a matter of pronunciation, Greek is a living language as well as being the Greek of the New Testament. So the parousia is the splendid, glorious arrival of Jesus in power as God's agent to take over rulership of this world. I didn't learn this in church. I'm not blaming anybody. Maybe I wasn't listening. Who knows? We don't have to do recriminations here. But I didn't know that. I was thinking if I were to write something in another book, I'd say, I think I'd start with, I was there. I sat as a, quote, good boy in church and school, boarding school, for years. I didn't know what I know now. Okay, you can say, well, we've all been deceived. Well, prove it. The Bible has become alive to me because I see that, I think I get the story. The story is not difficult. It is that there's a God, the one God of Israel. I learned in school how odd of God to choose the Jews. I remember that one thing from classroom. It stuck in my mind. God can do that. He looked at the Jewish nation and he said, there's something about these people I can use. That's God's privilege. He used the Old Testament, 75% of your Bible written in Hebrew, all the prophets, Moses before him, Abraham, Noah, all of them. He used them. He didn't use the Brits. He didn't use the Americans. He didn't use the Cubans or the Danish people. That's all right. God can do that. How odd of God to choose the Jews, how marvelous that he did. He gave them the Holy Scriptures, 75% your Hebrew Bible, right? Isn't that amazing? He did. And he said, listen, Jews, Shema Yisrael, God is one person. Now the story is that after the New Testament time, things changed. The leadership of the church fell into Greek hands. This is a very easy idea. Greek hands, it did. Everybody knows that. It doesn't read much here, that's the problem. You can grab any history book of the church. We know that after the New Testament times, the leadership of the church was not in Hebrew hands anymore. They weren't Jews, they were Gentiles. Inevitably something changed. And that was that they said, we're not sure about this Jewish idea of God being one. We want something broader than that, more international than that. Isn't that the way the human race might go wrong? Any of us here not know of bureaucratic models in our own time? Is it possible we're not very bright as a group? We're not. So the New Testament even is written by Jews with one possible exception. We all know Luke is the probable exception. <coughs> Luke was not a Jew and he wrote 33% of the New Testament. So when you're reading your New Testament Greek, you're reading Jewish stuff. Yes, it's Christian, uh, uh, we know that. We know that Christ has come, but it's still Hebraic thinking. It's a Hebraic way of thinking. We've got a long ways to go because we have an anti-Semitism in our blood almost. We don't want to be anti-anybody, right? Racism and things destroys us, right? People are unconsciously anti-Semitic. Luther is the classic example. You go to a Lutheran church. Have you read what Luther said about the Jews? Don't know? 
Now, this is not typical of what he said, but on one awful occasion, he said, I'd rather drown a Jew than baptize one. Now, that was an exceptional thing. You don't say that. You don't say that. It's like certain Middle Eastern countries who say, we're going to wipe Jews off the face. I mean, can you imagine that? We've got a long ways to go. So, point is that what you're hearing from us here is not something new. It's well known to many church historians and to many scholars, although they don't always say it too loud, maybe, but something happened to the faith after the Bible was closed, after the New Testament canon. What happened was Greek philosophy. Paul had said in his writings, beware of philosophy, don't go there. He said, beware of philosophy. So that's the very thing we didn't do. The church then launched into a different way of thinking. What happened was that the Jesus, whom in your Bible, began to exist in the womb of his mother by miracle. Isn't that beautiful? Read the accounts of Luke and Matthew, delight in them, clearly the Messiah, the Son of God, began as a miracle. And the Quran gets all troubled about that, well, God doesn't have sex with, well, we're not talking about sex yet. The Quran, and I'm trying to sort this out with the mosque in Fairfield in a few days' time, can we not bring a little sanity? They also believe that Joseph was not the father of Jesus. The Quran doesn't believe that Joseph was the father of Jesus. Oh, but we don't like to say that God has a son. Well then, who was the father? <laughs> can I not sort this out in ten minutes with the mosque? I think I can. They say, oh, we believe in God creating. Well, I do too. And they point to Adam, who's called the son of God. He was created, directed by God. But the point about Jesus, this is a creation in the womb of a woman. Isn't that beautiful? That's the difference. They don't like that. Words. We might think, no, 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 come on. Let's, human race, let's get a little sanity into our heads here. So this is a procreation. Can you, I'm going to see if the mosque will stand that word. Can you, can you take the word procreation? Because that's what it was. It was a procreation by miracle. So now you've got a different sort of Jesus. In the second century, they began saying, I think Jesus pre-existed his own birth. And you say to the public, your friends across the coffee table, what does that mean? How do you pre-exist yourself? Ever thought of that? I thought you began to to, 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 <coughs> you began to exist in the womb of your mother. That's what human beings do. You come into existence in the womb of your mother. How do you pre-exist yourself? How can you be before you are? These are the conversations I want on Fox News. Let me have a, a talk with Megan, please. I want Megan, who's very bright. I want her to engage these subjects. These are issues of immortality and truth, currently dividing the entire world into blocks of billions of people, Muslims against Christians and Jews. Come on, folks, we can do better than that. Imagine this. Suppose that Mary had a baby supernaturally. Wow! That gets your attention? Are we interested in Adam being created? I would think so. I've got to tell you this as a sideline here before we get into our text. We went to a, a very nice presentation on bird song. I don't do this very often. I've never been to one in my life, but Barbara's gardening community laid on an expert who's recorded all the bird songs and played them and talked about birds. It was, it was totally fascinating. It dawned on me there's a miracle going on around you all the time. You're not even aware of it. Absolutely incredible. And he played recordings of owls who say, Who cooks for you? Who cooks for you? Isn't that marvelous? I thought, dear God, this is extraordinary. All of this is happening around me. You know? Every little bird. And yesterday after our concert, we played a concert in a gated community. Played a lot of American songs. I get very American. I'm, I'm British, obviously, by nature, by nature, by origin. But we played the Stars and tri Stripes twice. They wanted to play twice, so we played. And here we are going. And my heart is pounding. I'm blowing my instrument. And I thought, this is wonderful. And when we came out, right on the apex of the building, in the top corner, there was a little bird up there, chirping away, singing its songs, various songs. I know, it was a special day for me, music and bird song. So that's the creation. We're going to work this with the mosque now. Let's see if we can use the word procreate. Let's see if, let's see if the Quran will buy that. God procreated a son in the womb of a mother. That's it. Now then, if you start talking about pre-existence, now you've got somebody coming into the womb from outside. That's a different story. And eventually said, no, 
He didn't have a beginning way back. He had no beginning at all. So now your dear friends in these churches, talk about this with them, are committed to the view that Jesus was eternally generated. <coughs> eternally generated. Oh, well, what did the church fathers so-called mean by that? They meant that he had a beginningless beginning. I hope you're smiling. Uh, explain that to your children, please. The, a beginningless beginning. Are we into, into a madhouse stuff here? Meanwhile, the Jews are aghast, by the way, because of our trinity. The Muslims are aghast, a billion of them, 1.6 billion of them. The Quran actually says to the Christians, don't say three, shut up, sit down. It's more or less the language. Desist, Christians, don't ever say three, always say one. So we've got a lot of work to do to get easy things worked out there. That's who we are, just for the, you know, it's a sort of recap of, of what we're doing. Some people are interacting with us out there. They will be, Carlos, give us a question or two eventually if somebody wants to say something. Please, Sherman. Huh? Please, Sherman. Please, Sherman. Please, Michelle? Where did they're um, all? Etienne says, I know, well, share that quotation with the pastor of the local Lutheran, Lutheran church here. Great. <laughs> yeah. Great. Oh, I put, uh, this is in reference to uh, uh, a quote in uh, Luther's book concerning the Jews and their lives. Yes. It's funny, you write a book. <laughs> That's the you title. don't even need to know the quote. You just need to know the title of the, the title. The title is better. I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and yes, let me, let me qualify what I said. It's true that when Luther said, I would rather drown a Jew than baptize him, that was a rare uh, uh, occasion. That wasn't his normal process. He did, in fact, baptize Jews. This but is, uh, the, this from his book, which is called Gegen die Juden und ihre Lügen, Against the Jews and Their Lies, he said what? Now, <laughs> give, us, give us a quote, give us a flavor of that. Uh, first, their synagogues or, or churches, which is weird, I don't like it. Do what? I missed the word there. Do what with the synagogues? First, their synagogues first. and their churches. Uh, should be set on fire. Oh, Secondly, their homes should likewise be broken down and destroyed. Thirdly, they should be deprived of their prayer books and Talmuds in which such idolatry, lies, cursing, and blasphemy are taught. Fourthly, their rabbis must be forbidden under threat of death to teach any more. I, I wish the human race would read this. Are they studying this in school? Come on now, before you go to the Lutheran church, that's your mentor. That's an appalling thing. Anyway, well, that's a history lesson we're doing now, but it's, it's good that you should mention that. As we said of Luther, he had very, very dark moments. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes had, somebody yes. says there are skeletons in Luther's closet. Um, yes. Keegan says there are even worse Luther quotes. Yes. Um, Not good. But back to when you were talking about the appropriation. Um, <coughs> Jeff, Jeff says, no, I think they just see it as created before the rest of creation. Um, they being who? They being the Muslims. The Muslims? Mm -hmm. they, 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 will, they will grant that Adam was created, and they will grant that Jesus was created. They don't like to use the biblical word generated. That's a very easy word. Genao in Greek, using the modern Greek pronunciation, simply means to bring into existence. It's what fathers do and what mothers do. So mothers conceive, fathers generate in the womb, and then mothers bear. This is rather easy stuff. The Muslims are not keen on the idea of God generating a son. Well, they don't like, to be specific, they don't like the biblical New Testament word, uh, right. begotten, uh, translated right. begotten. Yeah, no, it implies, would. obviously, a sexual relationship. Well, it does, unless you, <laughs> you're supposed to be able to read the text and see that it's nothing to do with sex. We have, that's what I'm going to try to explain to them. God did beget a son. That's the biblical language. The angel came and said, because of the miracle in your womb, Mary, Luke 1, 35, this child that you're going to bear, the child that's being begotten, brought into existence in your womb, will be called holy and son of God. That's very easy. Once we lost that, then we're off into outer space about pre-existing sons, eventually 
co-equal sons. So now God has a rival. This isn't good. And the Jews were the ones who accused Jesus of making himself God. Here's something to think about. They said, Jesus, these hostile Jews said, Jesus, you being a man, are making yourself into God. That's exactly what Trinitarianism later did. Please note. Trinitarianism wound up with the same view, actually, eventually, as the hostile opponents of Jesus. So how did Jesus answer that? He said, yes, I'm God, then you got it right, I'm God. No, 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 he didn't. First he recited the Shema, where only one person is God. And second he said, in John 10, you need to have these answers ready to go across the table, so to speak. He said, haven't you read in Psalm 82, Jesus said, if you go back and look at Psalm 82, it says, the judges are called gods. I get it. So you can use the word God of a judge representing God. So in answer to the accusation which said, you being a man, you're, you're, you're making yourself into God. Well, eventually the church did that very thing. But Jesus answered it by saying, no, no, I'm not God. The judges, as representing God, can be called theos in Greek, Elohim, they can. That's in Psalm 82. He explains that. So then would it be so wrong for me, Jesus, talking of himself, would it be wrong then for me to say, I'm the son of God? He never said he was God. So this, uh, this gives me a lot of fun to tell you. This is a gentleman in the one of the scholarly meetings in Atlanta very recently, who said, in answer to the question, did Jesus think he was God? The answer was, hell no. You're smiling. I hope you're getting this clear. Of course not. The Archbishop of Ramsey, Archbishop Ramsey, Archbishop of Canterbury, won a couple, three times back now, a good scholar, very good scholar, very bright man, Clever enough to be, I mean, distinguished enough in some way to be head of millions of Anglicans across the world, right? He says, and I quote, Jesus never claimed deity for himself. Think about that. Now, I could be wrong, but I want people to think about this. This is a very important question. Did Jesus go around and say, I'm God? By the way, I'm God. Now, the Jews accused him of that, misunderstanding him. But be careful, Trinitarians. You might be siding with the hostile Jews and getting it wrong. See, these are very important issues. Again, let's get Megan involved in the conversation. Hannity, let's, let's get him involved in talking about this. Why not? Because these are the ultimate questions that decide how the human race is going to proceed. Okay. Enough on that. Anybody want to say anything about that? Have we, have we driven anybody crazy with that? No, they were get talking about Trinitarian reasons mm -hmm. rather than Muslim as far as the process. Yeah. Yeah, That's fine. Okay, let's get back uh, then to... Uh, Yes. Tony Baldwin. Mm -hmm. He likes to come. Carlos, so do you know when that's going to be? Late, late July. We'll, late July. We'll throw out the dates. So. Yes. Yeah, that's in nice Fayetteville Mosque. We, we've got a very nice represent, yes. good representative there who's become a Muslim from a, Meth a Methodist background. So he's defending the ground. <coughs> we'll have a very gentle, non accusatory discussion. To try and establish well, what are the differences, explain what it is you think, what we think, how the Quran differs from the Bible and so on. Just clarifying. All right, then back in Luke 22, which incidentally is a very, very long chapter. Verse 33, a mere 71 verses, which is huge. We've just gone past 28, my eye catches that. So we'll start there and we'll pick it up at 28. This is the Lord's Supper being celebrated, as I understand it, on a Thursday evening, pending the Friday on which he was crucified. And he's keeping the Passover as the nation did. That's what the synoptics clearly say, I think. And he then reassures his followers. Are you getting this clearly in church? In verse 28, you apostles, he says, addressing the twelve, are those who have stood by me in my trials. Right, you're going to be tried, you're going to be tested as a Christian. You may have to face death even at worst. But you're going to be persecuted. You've done that. So here's what we're going to do in response, verse 29. Just as my Father, that's God, my Father has covenanted me, the Greek has a little stronger word than just granted, has given me by covenant Jesus said, my father has given, given me by covenant a kingdom 
So I now covenant with you that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and you're going to be promoted to sit on thrones to administer the 12 tribes of Israel. Wow. I should have read that as I heard it in church. You who followed me are going to sit on clouds in the sky, pink clouds, probably, and play harps forever. If your friends don't get it, and gaze at the face of God and sing hymns forever. It's false. It's absolutely so de-messianized, so de-Christianized, it's turned the story into something quite, quite different. And there are many authors who have said, if that's what Christianity is, I'm so bored with it, I'm not going to deal with it, right? So that is a wonderful verse. And I suggest that goes on the refrigerator. Matthew 19, 28 and Luke 22, 28. All the 28's there. Easy to remember. 19, 28 of Matthew and 22, 28 of Luke. That's the Christian reward. So when you hear a friend saying, when I get to heaven, so and so's gone, they've gone to heaven. Stop it. Listen to Jesus and say, this is the future administering the word. Now these are the apostles, we're not apostles, they don't have apostles like that today, you know. But we're Christians, we get the same sort of destiny, which is to, to fix the world on a grand scale, which is what every good American wants to do right now, look at the television. And that is in, if you want to take note, you want to turn to it, that's 1 Corinthians 6, verse 2, Paul said, in, in a moment of frustration at how silly these people were being, by the way, they were actually taking each other to court in the church in 1 Corinthians 6 too. What? Paul said, don't you know the saints are going to manage the world? I hope that strikes your heart. What? Me? Not yet. You. So get busy. What sort of person are you going to be now if you're going to be fit to manage the world? This is a high honor, isn't it? People have not realized in Romans 2, 7, we are commanded to seek for honor and glory. Yes, seek. Seek honor and glory of course because you'll be a better servant that way right the more influence you have the better servanthood you can you can master so actually makes some sense but i didn't learn that very clearly in church so there you are in verse 30 then tables in the kingdom yes eat and drink in the kingdom why not did jesus eat after he came back from death yes let's have some fish for breakfast was he a vegetarian no to my 23 million seventh-day Adventists out there i hope you're listening no. Why are you trying to be better than Jesus? No need to be more righteous than Jesus. Take him as your standard. He had fish, he had meat. Of course, relax, take it easy. Yeah. A little glass of wine occasionally. Wine with that fish. Yes. I mean, how silly can religion be? I'm following Jesus, but oh, I'm a lot better than Jesus. I don't touch that awful meat stuff. Come on now, SDAs out there. Let's not look silly. All right, then Simon, Simon, Satan has demanded to sift you, and I believe, I didn't check it, but I think the you there is actually plural, so he's addressing to Simon, but he's talking to all of them, and that's an interesting point. If you are a true believer, Satan is desiring to sift you, I take it, you know, sifting is that, shaking, isn't it? So walk carefully, because the devil is not pleased with what you're doing, he'd like to stop you, and that's what Jesus said here. Yes. 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 Can you have the Greek word that's right there? Certainly, I think we can. Carlos, you can check the Greek word for me there, but that would be emis, I think. U M E I S. Imas. Imas, sorry, Imas. It is said. It's verse 31. Then we might have got all the facts wrong. We might have to take all that back. What is it? U is. Good. That's cool. We got it. It's spelled in Greek. U M A S. So he addresses it to Simon with a, with an emphasis, right? Simon, Simon, get this. Don't miss. Don't miss my point here. Simon, the devil has desired to sift all of you. Plural. Yeah, nice. He's speaking to the leader as representing the group. That's a very Hebraic way to do it. So that's that's. The next nice. verse is singular. Okay, interesting. Singular, so Peter's Good. Especially, I Peter's especially. I love it. Yes, he is the singular for uh, the, In the next place. Yes. Jesus, okay. I think. In Matthew 3, so it's a 
same word, so it's singular. It's singular and plural, so it's addressed to all of them there in the next verse, just privately to Simon. I've prayed for you. Can you imagine Jesus praying for you? That's what the New Testament says is happening. He's the go-between, that's 1 Timothy 2, 5, one God, one man, Messiah, who intercedes for us. He's the go-between between between you and the Father. I get it. What what would that say about Calvinism? If Jesus is praying for someone. (laughs) I don't know why Jesus would bother doing that under Calvinism. So, that your faith may not fail. And you stop and you think, turn it to yourself. You read yourself into the text. How is my faith doing? I hope it's not failing. And you then, once you have repented, because he had to turn back, as you know. He went out and wept bitterly. And then had to repent. Once he did that, then here's the command to Peter. Strengthen your brothers and sisters. He was in a position of primacy. Now, I think the Pope got that quite wrong. He wasn't in an infallible line of Popes. If so, the Popes are very strange because they're married and Peter was... I mean, they're not married, Peter was. That's a bit odd, say to your Catholic friends. Peter was married, we know that. His mother-in-law was sick. The Popes then came along and said, we're the Popes and we we forbid marriage. That's dangerous. That's an obvious difference. Nor was he head of a state. He was never head of a state either. Or supposed no. to be a head of a state. But he was a leader. He is listed as number one in the list. First of all, Peter. He's, he's a spokesman and a leader. And uh, so when you repent, when you turn again, strengthen your brothers and sisters. So read the books of Peter with great delight and take the strengthening that comes from them. Then in verse 33, he said to him, Maybe I'll ask Brian to read verse 33 for me. Could you do that, please? Yes. But he said to him, Lord, with you, I am ready to go both to prison and to death. Wow. Uh, somebody would like to read 34? Read around around? Yes. Yeah. Where should we go next? Yeah. Jesus Kim? said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not grow this day until you deny three times that you know me. Wow. 35. Sarah? Sarah? Uh, then Jesus asked him. <laughs> When I sent you out to preach the good news and you did not have money, a traveler's bag, or extra clothing, did you lack anything? No, they replied. But now if you have money, you should take it as well as a bag, and if you do not have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. For I tell you that this which is written must be fulfilled in me, and he was numbered with transgressors. But that which refers to me has its fulfillment. They said, Look, Lord, here are two swords. He replied, enough of that. Okay, let's stop right there and uh, comment on some of that. He's very brave, isn't he? I'm ready to die for you. Don't worry about me, I'm fine. I'm sure he's glad to be prayed for. But then in 35, oh no, before that, we've got this one then. For 34, he said, I say to you, Peter, the rooster will not crow until you have denied me three times. That was amazing. It happened exactly. 36, he said to them, but now whoever has a money belt is to take it along. Likewise also a bag. And whoever has no sword is to sell his coat and buy one. People (coughs) divide on this point. They say, there you go. Jesus is in favor of violence. And I, I want to tell you, this is not what this passage says. As you read on. Some of them didn't have swords, by the way. It's interesting. So they weren't all armed. They weren't all, you know, NRA people. Give me my rights. But uh, he does then correct them because read 37 carefully. This is the explanation. That little word for is very important in Greek. It means this is what I mean. This is, let me unpack the earlier statement. This is what I'm intending to tell you uh, about why you should buy a sword. Uh, in, on this occasion. What is written about me has to be fulfilled. That's a prophecy. That's the point. There's a prophecy in the Old Testament that says, I'm going to be treated as a common criminal. You got it? That's why I have to have a sword. That can, is obviously fulfilled. He didn't have a sword. You go out and get the swords. Then that prophecy can say, he's just a common criminal. Just like everybody else. It isn't necessarily a justification of being part of a huge war machine. 
I mean, that would be a bit of a stretch. In your margin, you're going to read, you're going to pl pl perhaps please mark Matthew 26, 52, where he makes a statement about swords, which is rather more all-embracing, particularly, in 56, 26, 52. 26, 52, Jesus said to him, this is where Peter took up the defensive sword. Oh, come on now. I'm going to chop the ear off. I'm going to send my, defend my master against this invasion of the sword in that passage in Matthew 26. This is 51. Let me read it. Behold, one of those who were with Jesus reached and drew out his sword. So they did have some swords. That's true. And struck the slave, the high priest, and cut off his ear. Now Jesus' reply to this use of the defensive sword, may I point out here, put your sword back into its place, for all those who take up the sword will perish by the sword. That's rather sweeping. Rather sweeping is a statement. So he, it's, you know, a, a subject to be thinking about. But the earlier one in Luke is very clear. The reason for that sword, if you haven't got a sword, is that there's a, a text which says that he's going to be treated as a common criminal, and when they got over that, uh, he says, really, joke over. If you read down in 37, 38, he was numbered with transgressors. Well, that which refers to me will have its fulfillment on the basis of getting the swords. They said, here we are, Lord, two swords. He said, virtually, joke over, I think. It's enough. We've got the point. See, it's, a, it's a very subtle. In verse 36, he told whoever yeah. has no sword is to sell his coat and buy it. Yes, absolutely. So he's telling them buy a sword. But now, then somebody said, well, we have two already, so never mind. Two is enough for the fulfillment of the prophecy. That's what it is. So this was buy a sword or not? Absolutely. For, for the specific reason, the prophecy. The prophecy that's the explanation. Why get the swords? Because there's a prophecy which says that he will be reckoned as a common criminal. That couldn't happen until they had the swords. Then he says, it's enough. Two swords. Here are two swords. Now, that's it. A joke over. So anybody that has a weapon is a common criminal? Yes. Even if it's for defensive purposes? Apparently. Is it our Jesus? I think so. Well, yeah. I mean, it's obviously a bigger discussion than we want to do here. I have only made this point, which I did at Bethany in my training there, I wrote the paper on should Christians kill each other. I'll even talk about coming into the hunt. I know that's rare and that can happen. You, you have your sword to defend yourself. That's more, more unlikely. But think about international warfare, where Christians have always killed each other and pause before you are going to drop the bomb on another Christian. That's what I said uh, in my theological college. They liked that because they were of that thinking anyway. So anyway, it's a, a bigger subject. Actually, what Michel just said is yeah. the conclusion of one uh, commentary I read, that the implication then, mm -hmm. if we're reading it, yeah. as, In context, as yeah. it says that it was to fulfill prophecy, yeah. then the implication would be that Christians who arm themselves yeah. would be transgressors, would be criminals, and they will die. As In this particular passage. And can I also add a commentary here from the Bible Knowledge Background Commentary. Okay. It says that had Jesus actually advocated armed combat, two swords could scarcely have been sufficient. Remember, they, they said that our whole armor, basically. Moreover, had Jesus remarked being one of approval, yeah. then we might have expected his reply to be in the plural. They yeah. are enough. Yeah. No, Jesus' answer must be seen as a word of frustration whereby he cut the conversation short, it's yeah. also possible Jesus may have intended his comment to be tinged with a bit of sarcasm. Maybe, says. sort of joke over, something like that. Anyway, it's an interesting passage. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's I, I know, a lot. He's talking to, to them. He is. Not, I mean, when he says whoever. Yes. I mean, he's talking to them. Yes. Well, no question. Mm -hmm. He's talking to them, get a sword, because there's a Bible so, so verse that needs to be fulfilled. Yeah. Is it transgressing then to have a money bag? No, because no. There's a money belt just to take it along. You can do that, go, yes. Go by a sword. Right. So, I think what makes are we transgressors if we got a money bag? No. <laughs> no, obviously not. I really have never 
No. I think what makes them a criminal are the swords. Yeah. In the eyes of the state, or of the Jewish okay. lawyers in this case, if you're, you're armed and they're coming to get you, mm -hmm. so I think the implication is that the sword makes one a transgressor, and that's why Jesus quotes. Apparently. Anyway, read, read some of the commentaries, it's interesting. My wider point, though, when I was at school there, getting that degree was, it's an unconscionable for me to think of Christians killing each other. So, the local thing is, is trickier. However, when the Roman Catholic blessed, the Roman Catholic priest, in one of the quotes that I produced there, he blessed the bomb that killed the nuns. He said, change the life. Because Jesus said, by this you will be recognized as benign disciples. You've had love one for another. You cannot be thinking of killing other Christians. Now think of this, please. The clergy are not permitted to bear arms. What are we saying there? Why do we say, I don't want to arm the Methodists here in America to go and kill the Methodists in Germany. What are we saying? We're saying, heaven forbid, but I'm saying, take that one stage further, just as bad as the clergy as it is for anybody else, though. And also, that struck me as telling. what about uh, the Japanese who attacked us at Pearl Harbor and tortured people? I mean, they weren't Christians. No, they weren't. If you're sure that the bomb you're dropping is not on Christians, that would be a, a different scene. I see that. How about, how about a Russian? Would that kill any, anybody who were innocent children? Have you seen the pictures? We burned those people to death. Children. Yeah, and they did a whole lot of bad things to our people. Oh, they did? They would have done a whole lot more had they not stopped the war, but that's yes. a whole other thing. That's another whole story. I'm just saying, not everybody that's at war in this world, especially no. nowadays and, and to come, right. it is fighting against another Christian. That's very true. That's very true. Also, there are a whole lot of people in the world that are not Christians that Absolutely. are enemies of yes. the faith yes. of us. Yes. Also, the question about the sword thing is, if then the implication is the other way, that a Christian should be armed, especially for self-defense purposes, yeah. did the, was the church wrong for the first 400 years at least? Well, it's, yes, <coughs> it's not a part of scripture, but it's a certain right. in, indication the earliest church was against it. But let's leave that subject for a moment. It's a big one, we won't resolve it all now. Different denominations divided in their views on this point. 39. Now, Garden of Gethsemane. Who could read 39 for us, please? We've got some background. Somebody read 39 for us? 39? Yeah. And he came out and proceeded as was his custom to the Mount of Olives, and disciples also followed him. Good, thank you. When he arrived at the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. Mm -hmm. 41. 41. He withdrew from them about a stern's throw and knelt down and began to pray. Saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. He prayed more fervently and had not He finished praying, stood up, and went over to the disciples. He found them asleep, worn out by grief. Mm -hmm. And said to them, Why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not enter into temptation. While That's he was tough. still speaking, a crowd appeared led by Judas, one of the twelve disciples. Mm -hmm. Judas went up to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Mm -hmm. When those who were around him saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus answered and said, Stop, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. And Jesus said to the chief priests and officers of the temple and elders who had come out against him, Have you come out as against a robber? Mm -hmm swords and clubs? Why didn't you arrest me in the temple? I was there every day. But this is your moment, the time when the power of darkness reigns. Okay, let's stop right there. As I read that passage there about pray that you fall not into temptation, that is rather striking, isn't it? So prayer then puts up a shield against being attacked by the devil. I see that. 
And he prays so fervently that drops of blood. I've heard medically that if you are really so tense and have a stress, you can actually sweat blood, literally. That apparently is the case here. I also like that on the positive side, the angel appears strengthening him. That reminds me of the book of Daniel, where the angel shows up and, and imparts a, a, a revelation to Daniel. So an angel can intervene in your life and strengthen you. That's nice. We don't pray to angels directly, I know that. But God can send an angel, and that angel can actually empower you in that moment to survive whatever temptation is there. I like, I don't like it, but it's interesting psychologically. 45, there's, a, there's this worn out with grief. The stress must have been amazing, right? Their master, their rabbi is about to be taken off and killed, and they're just exhausted by depression, the whole, the whole awful scene that's going on here. And so he rebukes that. Get up. Pray that you may not enter into temptation, repeating himself there. Anyway, there's a lot of interesting material, very tragic, very sad, but the story doesn't end there, of course. And then uh, he, there's not much I think we need to comment on here, except that the sword was rebuked, as in Matthew 26, that particular sword at least was rebuked. 53 is interesting to me. While I was with you daily in the temple. People think of Jesus as just dying and rising. I'm making a broad generalization here. They don't think of him firstly and primarily as their, and I shouldn't say primarily, but equally, that's the way to put it, equally and most importantly, he's their rabbi. Somehow we've been induced to think of Paul as the founder of Christianity. Now, Paul doesn't do anything that Jesus doesn't do. Paul is a faithful exponent of Jesus. But we tend to forget that Jesus was first a rabbi, and that I find impressive when Listen, I was in the temple with you, should we say, 6 o'clock in the morning? Every day, day after day. And the ordinary people, not so much the establishment, so watch out, the establishment tends to be much blinder than the ordinary people. The ordinary people flocked in there, I don't know how many hundreds of them, into the temple, 6 o'clock before the day's work began, to listen to this rabbi, because, my goodness, he spoke with authority. Not like their average priests, that was the point. And what did they do? They killed him for it. Isn't that awful? It does, I think, teach us a lesson that we as a group of human beings are not that smart. We're not that smart. We better be very sure we're not killing Jesus while praising him. That means listening very carefully, I suppose, to his teachings. Anybody, anybody want to say anything further on that? There's some comments? Yes. Please. What's, what's out there? There's comments about weapons. Okay. No, let's leave that for a moment, I think. We, we, we hash that subject over from time to time. <laughs> Anything else? That's it, just, just with it. Jesus, the rabbi. You call me rabbi and lord, he said, and you're doing well. John 13, 13. You call me rabbi and lord. Most people tend to think, he died for my sins, I'm forgiven. That's great. It is great. But it's not the whole story. Because many will say, multitudes will say in that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this, that, and the other for you? Listen, I never recognized you. Wow, that's rather striking. This is a tough teacher. So the solution is get on one's knees. Oh God, if I'm deceived, help me out here. I don't want to get this wrong because multitudes, Matthew 7, 21, are going to say, look, we did this all in your name, Jesus. We even did miracles in your name. We showed up to church. We did all this stuff for you, Jesus, only to find that they weren't accepted. That's a very challenging text. So... Before dawn, 